Welcome to Words of Aloha with Pastor Izzy Manzo of Amazing Grace Ministries International. We're headquartered in Kailua Kona on the Big Island of Hawaii. Join us now as we get into God's Word. Now, would you turn with me to John chapter 20? I want to show you something real quick. And John, this is the part where, to me, when I read this story, what Paul is writing to the church at Corinth, saying, Jesus appeared first to Cephas, then to the twelve, then to over 500, then to James, then to the twelve again. Now, some people get confused. They say, but there wasn't twelve. I'm like, you're getting too literal. He, he means the... Gr I was raised in, in Arizona, okay? When you're, when you're raised in, in a Hickville, Arizona, you, you, whether you like it or not, there's country music around, there's country stories, there's westerns, that's all they watch, westerns. Watched um, The Dirty Dozen when I was a young man. There was um, like Charles Bronson and... Uh, you know, Lee Marvin, or Ernest Morgan, the, this is an old school. This is like the Dirty Dozen, the OK, it was the gunfight at OK Corral in Tombstone, Arizona. You know, it was a story from like 1881 about a sheriff and a couple guys that joined the one side and the other guys were the, the Dirty Dozen, you know, they got to have a shootout. And the story's been remade, actually, rehashed a few different times. You know, the, the, there was the one with um, where Kirk Douglas was Doc Holloway. I remember that one. That was in the 70s. Like 76, they did, they did their own, ver like a newer version from the 57 version, you know, in the 60s. Th this movie's been, re the story's been retold. When I listen to the story, you know, Doc Holloway, and they, they got the Marshall Wyatt Earp, you know, and some of you guys know about this story, even though you didn't have to grow up in Arizona and be subjected to it as much as I was. If they said the Dirty Dozen, does it mean every single do one of the dozen was, was behind the fence shooting? Or it just refers to that gang. It's, the, it's that group. It's like a title. You're a part of that group. Well, when Paul is saying the 12, that he appeared to the 12 apostles, what he's saying is there was 12 that were picked out. Now, he doesn't go into the particulars and say, and one went and hung himself, so it was technically only 11, and one was missing, so it was technically only 10 the first time, and then later it was, he just says the 12 First the Lord appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then to five hundred, then to James, then to the twelve again. And so when I listen to that, I go, okay, so I know which group he's talking about. I'm not going to stress about the number, because I actually had one guy want to fight over the number. Well, Paul didn't say the right number. He should have been to the ten, and then to the eleven, and then not the... No, he's talking about the group. You guys get this, right? He's just talking about the group. The apostle. In fact, if you want to read Acts chapter 2, you'll find out that the guys um, go, you know, we're down a guy. I mean, Judas hung himself, and uh, we need to fill in the thing, and they have a vote. We got, who's been with us since the beginning, heard everything Jesus taught, all this stuff, you know, and they put forward two guys. I don't know if you're familiar with this. We don't hear anything about those two guys. One of them gets chosen and by law, and they go, um, okay, you're in the group. You're in the twelve. But he really wasn't in the 12 picked by Jesus. He, he, they just wanted to keep the, you know, it's like, let's keep the dozen complete. Let's get our 12 back together, you know. Whatever. Just something men do. But what's important is that he appeared again. And I want to show you the part where he appears the second time to the group, this time with Thomas included. Now, I know Judas isn't there because he already hung himself. If I put together the story from the gospel accounts, he's gone. But turn with me to John chapter 20, and I'll show you something. Jesus then, let me see right here, verse 19. So when it was evening on the first day of the week, when the doors were shut and the disciples, it says, were, were inside for fear of what? I don't know if some of you realize this. They were afraid. Of what? Of the Jews. The Jews just killed their leader. A week's gone by and they're hiding out because they've heard their leader's resurrected. He had appeared to them, but he vanished. So they're like, um, we're a little freaked out. 
and they're inside hiding. And Jesus came, and he stood in their midst, and he said to them, what? Shalom. That's Hebrew for peace. Peace be with you. In English we say. And he showed them his hands and his side, and the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, Shalom. Peace be with you. The, as the Father has sent me, so I do what? I send you. He says, and, and, and so when he had said this, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. And now, if you forgive the sins of any, their sins have been forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they've been retained. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples were saying to him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see his hands and the imprint of the nails, and I put my finger in the place of the nails and put my hand into his side, then I will not believe. Just so you know, the dirty does, I mean, the apostles really trusted each other, didn't they? The, uh, the, the other ten are saying, it was the Lord. And, the, and Thomas goes, I don't believe not one of you. Not unless I touch him myself. I stick my finger in the hole. You say he's got the hole in his hand? I got to stick my finger in the hole. Now, some people... When I was growing up, we went to Catholic school. They called him Doubting Thomas because he doubted what the other guys said. But come on. There's Matthew. What was his occupation? A tax collector. Those are trustworthy guys. You got Peter, James, John. What was their occupations? Fishermen. They're always known for telling big tales about the fish was this big when they caught it, and then when they got home, it was this big. And then two weeks later, it was that big, you know. And then a month later, so big you can't even stretch, you know. I mean, come on. They, they the, you know, some people don't realize this. When you look at the quality of characters that Jesus picked for the 12 apostles in the Bible, when you read about them and you realize Thomas didn't even trust the other guys, it's a whole different picture than I was painted when I was growing up in my Catholic upbringing with stained glass. You know, I figured... You made it to stained glass. You were like, holy. Besides that, the stained glass guys were, they were up off the ground. They were like floating in the air and up high. And, you know, we look at them. And my grandfather used to show me the pictures and tell me the story. You know, this is Jesus with Peter and James and John on the mount. And this, you know, we go around the stations of the cross and different things. And I, I thought, you got to be like perfect to make it to stained glass. Then when I read the scripture, I found these guys were just regular fellas. And they had doubts, and they, and they had flaws, and Peter denied the Lord. Judas betrayed the Lord. I mean, these guys were not perfect. And Thomas, he knew it. And this is why I love the Bible. The Bible is not like one of those glossy books where they, oh, everyone's perfect. It can't relate. They, I can relate to these guys who are like, yeah, I don't trust those guys. In fact, I got to touch him myself. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm a hands-on learner. I'm a very visual learner. I, I'm glad that today they actually acknowledge that there's different ways that we learn. Some people are auditory learners. My son can hear a story and remember all the details. You know, he, I've been teaching Bible study so long with him in the youth group. He would lay down in the chair behind me in the house when we had all the kids in the youth group. And he would have his eyes closed. Everybody like, he's asleep. Yeah, sometimes. Well, had a hard swim. But many times he was just closing his eyes to listen. To block out all the other distractions of stuff going on in the room. And he listened. And I know that he listened because the next day some kid that missed class would, would uh, miss the study would say, so what was it about? And he would tell him every detail. And I'd just be sitting there, wow. I mean, that took me years to learn. And I had to study and I had to stare and memorize. And all he did was, what? listen you know today they're starting to figure this out some of you are auditory listeners you know you probably want to close your eyes now so you get block out all the beauty and the distraction of the waves and right, and just focus on the message 
But some of you, you're, you've got to see it in print. Or you're a hands-on tactile learner. You know, you need to stick your hand on the bolts and wrench the engine and do it yourself and actually feel it to get how does it work. I'm that way. I, I did much better at figuring out engines when I actually could tear one apart. And, you know, see all the bolts and, and, and memorize. This one's got to go back in this hole and this one. And then put it back together. And, you know, just the process made me go, oh, now I get how this thing works. I got to see all the parts. I got to move them. I got to see how they function. And some guys can look at a diagram. I am, I tell you, I hate diagrams. I mean, Jen says I only consult the instructions when last, you know, last resort. You know, when you buy the box with all the stuff, assemble this. I like get all the pieces together and start looking. I start going, to, I think this could go here. You know, she's like over there reading the thing. She's like, honey, it's got a manual. And she learns everything from the manual. Now, we all learn differently, okay? That's fine. But Thomas is my hero. The guy who they call Doubting Thomas, I say, yay, Thomas, you're so, I'm so glad you're in this story. Seriously, I'm thanking God he was in this story. You know why? Because I would have probably been him if I was in the group. I'm sure I would have been like, I don't trust you guys. Fisherman, tax collector. Schmuck. I'm not trusting. I don't know. -uh. I got to see myself. And not only do I have to see, what did he say? He's a tactile learner. I have to what? Stick my finger in the hole in his hand. I got to stick my hand in the hole in his side and see that it's really him. You say it is, but not till I, not just see, but touch. Now you say, what's the big deal about that? The big deal is Paul is saying that Jesus appeared first to Cephas, then to the 12, then to 500, then to James, then to the 12 again. What's the big deal about that? It's because it is a big deal. When Luke wrote, he said he appeared over 40 days with many convincing proofs. He had to appear in ways that they would be able to, they would know. Like when he did the boat thing with the fish and you haven't come on, we'll do that later. But he did it in a way they would know it was really him risen from the dead. And this one, Thomas, look what he does. After eight days, verse 26 of John 20 says, when they were inside again, Jesus came having that the doors had been shut and he stood in their midst and said, Shalom, peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, reach your finger, see my hands. Go ahead, stick your finger in my hand. Reach your hand here in my side. And he said, and do not be any longer unbelieving, but be believing. Let me help. He didn't go, shame on you, Thomas. Didn't believe the other guys. No, not, not our Jesus. Jesus. Jesus helps our faith. When we're having a hard time believing, Jesus accommodates it. He's like, here, go ahead. Didn't chide him, didn't, didn't give him any razzing about what you didn't believe. He just went, here you go. See. Then Jesus says something really interesting. Look, look what he says next. Then Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God, it's you. And Jesus said to him, because you have seen me, you have believed. But blessed are those who did not see me and yet believed. How about us that didn't get to see him? You know, sometimes I, I'm kind of jealous. I'm like, give me the time machine. I got to go back and I want to sit next to Thomas. In fact, no, I'll switch places with Thomas. I'll do Thomas for the day. Let me stick my finger. And the Lord goes, no, blessed, more blessed. Look at this. Are those that did not see and yet believed. Now, the Bible tells us faith comes by what? Hearing, and hearing by the word of God. When you hear these things, they were written so it would help your faith to grow. It's good for us to hear these stories. It's even good for us to hear there was a guy who didn't believe till he stuck his finger in the, in the hole. And I don't think we really need to knock him as doubting Thomas. I think you just got to call him what it is. I mean, he's just Thomas the tactile learner. I mean, let's be real. He just needed to see it in a way that a convincing proof that worked for him. And Jesus knew that. Mahalo for joining us. If you'd like more information about us, 
go to our website, AmazingGraceKona.com, and click the link to follow us on Facebook. That's AmazingGraceKona.com. Mahalo and God bless.